that person and all the unborn behind them are waiting for us to invent the technology so that their genius can be shared. And that is the moral obligation we have to keep making new things, keep finding new solutions. And what we gain out of all this is choices, possibilities, freedoms. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you're listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture from the individual to society at large. This week, our guest is the renowned Kevin Kelly, who many of you will no doubt recognize as the founding executive editor of Wired Magazine and author of revelatory books such as What Technology Wants and The Inevitable. In this episode, we dig deeply into what drives Kevin's techno-optimism, the ideas of spiritual technology, the future of China, the regulatory landscape of artificial intelligence, and ultimately how technology has shaped our species and what we define as the human condition. Now, before I get into it, I do want to take a quick moment to let you all know about Singularity's premium membership experience and how you can unlock our special offer for two weeks of free access. Singularity's premium membership is your chance to be part of an exclusive, private community of like-minded leaders and changemakers who are committed to professional growth and impact. You'll have access to a constant stream of webinars, roundtables, and professional networking events focused on exploring the key concepts and trends of exponential technology, where you'll be joined by both your peers and by a panel of academics and experts. You will also receive research and insights created and curated by our global experts, which are designed to help members gather, develop, and inform action on a variety of topics and issues related to exponential technology and impact. For a limited time, we're giving podcast listeners a free two-week trial membership of this premium experience simply by going to singularity.org slash two-week trial. That's singularity.org slash two, as in the number two, week trial, where you can click try free to begin. You'll also find this link in the show notes of the podcast. And there you have it, everyone. Two weeks of premium membership ready for the taking. So if you've ever wanted a chance to get a look inside Singularity, this is a great opportunity to do so. So check that out if your curiosity is piqued. But for now, let's get into the reason you're here. Everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, the titan of technology himself, Kevin Kelly. One of the things that I found super inspiring about you and that attracts me really deeply to your train of thought is that you have this really deep pool of techno optimism. And when I was looking into your bio, one of the things I realized was, like myself, um, when you were in your early 20s, you went and traveled the world started backpacking. And I know for me personally, that kind of constant exposure to new cultures gave me an acceptance of life that might be different than the life that I'd known. And I think that made me really open to the idea of kind of a radical future. For you personally, do you feel like your techno optimism comes from some of those earlier travels? Or do you think it comes from a different place? Um, it, it comes from, okay, my optimism comes from several places, but um, there's definitely a very large component that has come from my travels in Asia, particularly at the time that I was traveling, which was, I began in the early 70s, at which time a lot of these Asian countries were predominantly, you know, medieval. They had not changed in, they had not been developed. So they were living very much as ahead for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And within my own experience, I saw them transforming from third world, if not, you know, previous centuries into modern times. And then later on into the future where the, the, some of the cities became even more advanced. And so at that time, when I was first traveling and they were in medieval times, it was, hard to imagine them progressing so fast 
it didn't there wasn't really a good explanation outside of technology for why that would have ever happened and um but seeing it happen even early on uh, it gave me a great sense of optimism of what was possible because the progress that they had done was hundreds of years of progress in a very short time and they were bootstrapping it wasn't because some people from outside were making it happen. It was something that was an internal ambition. And um, that sense of the possible um, stayed with me. I, I realized, well, if those little villages in India could modernize as quickly as that, then there was, and, and the reason why they could was because of all these technology that was coming in. That was the only change there was. It was at a great resistance socially and other things were all working against it, but the technology was what was really pushing this. And that made me very optimistic about um, the rest of the world and what we could do into the future. And a, another part of your techno optimism seems to come from this idea of the spiritual side of technology. Mm -hmm. It's something I feel like I've heard you talk a lot about. Can you can you kind of, in your own words, tell me like what that spiritual side of technology means to you? Yeah, um, we tend to think of technology as a very human activity. Um, that it's something that humans have made. That it's you know, that it's artificial in that sense of artifice. And by the way, that's also where we get this, I think, mistaken idea that it's contrary to nature because it's sort of like we have set ourselves in our minds that as opposing nature. But I kind of came to a different conclusion. Uh, and my conclusion is that technology is a cosmic force. It's not really a human force. It's a cosmic force that began at the Big Bang, and it's part of the kind of self-organizing dynamic that has organized matter into molecules and stars, the whole star sequence, and out of that planets, it's self-organized, and you know, even the galaxies themselves, but certainly in at least one neighborhood, we have self-organizing life, which um, came from the right conditions and it has self-organized all these species and including in them is the self-organizing sentience, mindfulness. And I see the, I see what we do with technology as an extension and acceleration of that. And it's governed by the same kind of inherent laws that organize these, the self-organization. And in that sense, um, I would say it's a reflection of things bigger than us. It's, it's a big story. There's a huge arc through the universe. And of course, the technology is running through us and will go beyond us. And we ourselves are both created and the creators. We, we, are, we, we have made ourselves. We have invented our humanity. And we will continue to invent it. And of course, in other galaxies around the or even other planets in the galaxy, there will be other forms of technology. So I, so I define technology as anything that a mind makes. And I would include that animals, beavers and birds who use their brains to make things. And I think it's extended to whatever other alien species might be making. So the technology, and, and, and in my book, they will replicate a lot of the developmental sequence of technologies is, is that they it was sort of it's developmental not just evolutionary meaning that it will replicate a certain sequence that's just built into the physics you know just you're, you're going to just as there are kind of inevitable elements made through in stars there will be ele uh, elemental discoveries made on any planet with 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 technology and so there is a sense of inevitability about general forms of what are made that are governed by the physics and so 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 that is a, that is a kind of a story of 
technology being an inherent component of the universe that begins at the Big Bang, it runs through it, it's larger than ourselves. And to the extent that you have any sense of the divine, I would say that technology is a reflection of that divineness, that divinity. And so, um, so that would be the kind of spiritual component. And then there was kind of a final moral component to it. And that is that um, one of the directions, there's no destiny here. There's no omega point. They're just radiating out different directions. And one of those directions is um, that we, life and all these other things, self-organization, including the, the technium, the technology, what it's doing is it's increasing the possible things that could exist. It's increasing the space of possibility. It's making more things possible. So the thing about life is that without life, there are certain arrangements of atoms that just aren't going to happen. They're too improbable. In fact, most things that happen in life are improbable. But how we get to those things is through this process called life. So it's assembling the improbable. And it's each time you make a new species it actually opens up the territory for new species. That's the genius of ecology and ecosystems is that they create niches. But rather than new species filling up niches, new species actually create further niches. And so you have this kind of expanding platform of which again, technology is an extension of that. And that expanding platform is the pa platform of the possible. And so what we're doing with technology is increasing the choices and possibilities that we have in life. And that's the difference between us and someone living a thousand years ago is that we sitting around here, even the poorest of us today have far more choices about what we can do in, in any, any dimension from do as play or do as work than someone a thousand years ago. And the reason why people stream in by the hundreds of millions into cities today is because they're coming, because there's choices that they don't have in their beautiful villages with their organic foods and their strong communities and their beautiful vistas and the certainty of knowing who they are. They leave all that to go to a city where it's grimy and gritty and unknown because there's a chance that they could be a mathematician or a ballerina or a web designer instead of just being only a farmer. And so technology is the force that's making these opportunities and choices possible. It's making the possibilities possible. It's through technology, it's stuff that we invent. And what it does is it gives us individually more possible ways to share our special mix of talents. And, and even though this is not panacea, this is not utopia, this is protopia, where there is as many new problems being made, what we gain out of all this is choices, possibilities, freedoms, options. And that, and we have a moral obligation to keep expanding that. And that is the, the moral dimension of technology you you mentioned earlier there that humanity was our first invention right can, can you unpack that a little bit yeah 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 so we have been we well let's start with a kind of a passive thing we have been changing or have been been changed in our genes ever even from the time that we would recognize ourselves as human we've been undergoing genetic change and a lot of that genetic change, not a lot of it, some of that genetic change that we've undergone has come from the things that we have made. So we domesticated other animals, uh, the herding animals, uh, and milked them, cows and goats, and horses. And very quickly, we evolved uh, adult lactose tolerance in response to this new channel of nutrition. Um, 
so our, our genes, we change it and we invented this domestication and then we changed ourselves in response to that or our, our cells change in response to that. And likewise, when we invented uh, or captured or controlled fire and started cooking, the main thing that cooking was doing was that it was, uh, it was an external stomach. It was a way to digest things that we were not been capable of digesting without the food. So therefore we had, again, an additional kind of nutrition that very quickly, again, reshaped our brains and our teeth and our jaws in response to cooked food. So, and, and we became dependent in some ways on cooking to have the kind of nutrition that could enable the kind of brain that we had. So cooking in some ways was associated I wouldn't say a cause, but it's associated with our large brains and our ability later on to have consciousness. And so, um, and so that is one way in which our inventions have been changing us. And so I argue that we're the first animal that we domesticated even before dogs or cows or goats, we domesticated ourselves. We made ourselves more civilized. We made ourselves more dependent on our inventions and our own technology. And people often talk about the moment when we kind of become wholly dependent on technology and we can't live our lives without it. And the, the truth is that we passed that hundreds of thousands of years ago, maybe even a million years ago, because without technology, without a blade, without the control of fire, we're defenseless against predatory animals. We would die instantly. So if you eradicated every bit of technology from the planet, we could not have a knife or a stick or use a stone as a hammer um, or fire, we're not gonna last long. So, 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 so we are, have been, completely dependent on technology for our survival for a very long time. And of course we're binding that ever more so where the distinction between us and technology is not so clear. And again, we've been moving in that direction for a long, long time. And, you know, we have, uh, well, I don't know what percentage of the people who wear corrective eye glassing or LASIK and Kant, it's a very large percentage of the people who depend on this technology just to see. And so um, uh, in that way, I say that we're inventing uh, ourselves and, and all lots of the things that we attribute to us as humans, maybe a sense of fairness, a sense of law, mercy, are primarily things that are conveyed in culture, in culture, something we've had. And there's, we don't inherit those necessarily in our genes. We're not born with that. There are some aspects of it where we felt cheated. I mean, animals felt cheated, but, but by and large, a lot of the things that we associate with being human and humanity are things that are carried by the culture, which is our invention of ours. We're passing on things through grandmothers and through oral and teaching. That is a technology, the technology of language, which we've invented. And so um, in that way, our humanity is something that we have invented. Yeah, and that made me think, do you feel like a lot of our cultural upgrades, you know, civil discourse, things like... Um, democracy, a lot of things we hold important as values, they seem to often be the result of technological advances, right? Yes. Where writing, books, yep. the internet, it seems like right. civil rights, for instance, are benefited by more people being able to see empathetically into different lives through the internet. Is that something that you see a lot with technology as a, a forcing function for cultural yes. upgrades? Absolutely, you put you put it very well. I mean, our, a lot of our sense of justice and fairness comes 
and, and we kind of almost say it, you know, becomes from the law, which is written down. If the law was just oral, it's much harder to enforce it, to believe it. Um, the fact that it's in ink that doesn't change, supposedly, gives us monumental authority. And so, um, absolutely, I would, I would say, you know, a lot of what we believe about ourselves and humanity has been enabled through the technology, the social technology that we've invented, including things like um, laws, which we have, which we have in the back of our mind, um, that kind of sense of fairness, the, um, you know, I believe in moral progress. I believe that, that we do progress in moral dimension. And that's all carried, again, in the culture, which is, and it's carried either by writing and oral transmission and behavior and norms, but it's carried by this invention of a society and civilization. So civilization itself, of course, is, a, is an invention. And um, it, does a lot, you know, education, the whole idea of kind of um, domesticating young males. That's basically what civilization's job is, is to domesticate young males. Otherwise they're just barbarians and they'll destroy you. So um, that is, yeah, that's that I think is primarily, again, I have a very broad definition of technology. So I would include all our social constructs as technological. Even language, for that matter. Even language, um, calendars, all these soft things um, are things that are carried um, by the culture, and the culture is is an invention as well. Yeah, speaking of culture and going back to your travels a little bit, you've spent a lot of time in China, I believe. At some point, you said you go about every three months or so, I pre-pandemic, of course. Um, how do you reconcile what you're seeing happening in China and maybe even specifically around their social technologies with your predictions for the future. Cause it seems like there's a really a bit of a tension between the Western world's approach to the future of technology and the Eastern world and being somebody who's so close to both. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear how you reconcile that. Yeah. So um, one explanation for the primarily the Chinese way maybe some extent what could happen in, you know, Korea and Japan or neighbors. But um, one explanation for what, for the Chinese way with this um, data technology is that they're going for the total, total information society. And their premise is, look, we're engineers. We're going to engineer society. And if we're engineering policies, we want it based on data. We want to have as much data about how people actually behave in order to make the best policy decisions. This, that's a very reasonable beginning point. Let's take, let's have evidence based policy. And we're going to gather as much data as we can to make evidence-based policy. Therefore, we will track everything. That is the initial thought. And um, the thing about it is, it's actually a really good way to make policy. Um, so the dangers is very obvious, which is, well, total transparency as total surveillance. Uh, if, if it's the state that's doing it, then you have a problem of power um, and symmetry. And so, um, you know, the, the downsides of that are, are very obvious to everybody. And so it's going to come down to like, well, what's, where do you make the trade-off? And, and, and um, more importantly, in my vocabulary is how do you restore the symmetry? Mm. So the thing about transparency is that if a transparency is asymmetrical, meaning there's large institutions that know everything about you, but you don't know anything about them or what they're using it for, or how they do it, that's asymmetrical. 
if you had a really truly total transparent thing, you'd be able to know as much about what's going on inside the government, inside everything. And that would be a different world. That's the David Brin transparent society version, which I think is worth you know, considering. And so, um, so for, for me, I think some of the unease, the justifiable unease we have about that is that it's because of the asymmetry. Because there's a asymmetrical, in, unequal balance in where the knowledge and information goes, it's all going one way. If we can restore some of that symmetry, then I think we feel better because in actual fact, humans, over millions of years, evolved without any privacy whatsoever. Mm. We're totally used to this. We're totally comfortable knowing everything there is about each other, but it's symmetrical. I know everything about you, literally. I mean, it's it, it, people have no idea. Modern people don't appreciate how intimate tribal life was and how much you were visible to each other and um there are some not so good things about that um but we do know that we're okay with it i mean that we can live with it so um so i think having a total transparent society um is not we have existence proof that some version of that can work. Whether it works in modern world remains to be seen and we'll have to figure out how, you know, what kind of trade-offs you want to do it. But I suspect that um, it's worth considering. And um, so the Chinese are kind of pioneering one version of that. And that's the version of like an evidence-based policy society and i think they will go further than most people think they will the chinese are supporting it so far because they had 300 million or more maybe 500 half a billion people move from the countryside into cities who were not prepared for city life they were literally country bumpkins they crapped on the street they, they 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 weren't prepared for living that way and so there was a lot of crime corruption you know sleaze um bad attitude i mean there was a lot of ills and Having the transparent society has actually really, truly helped. And the Chinese see that and they know that. It's like, oh, you put cameras everywhere. People behave a lot better. I'm for that. And so, um, uh, so, so far, generally, they have the backing of the general citizen because the total surveillance that they have had in general has been worth it to them for the freedom the political freedom that they don't have that they're aware that they don't have and they're saying well if i have to choose between being able to publicly criticize the government or ha having nobody steal my car because of the cameras i'll take i'll take the cameras it's a good trade yeah do you you've said before that um, you think the Chinese need to embrace failure and challenge authority yeah. more? I believe that's something you said. Do you think that's one of the ways to help restore that symmetry that you're talking about? Is that kind of why that yeah. is meaningful to you? Yeah, I, I think questioning authority, which is sort of the iconic American stance, it's what almost every American Hollywood movie is about. Um, that is... That... That, that's sort of part of the parcel of, you know, the demand and transparency being symmetrical. Um, and um, 
it's larger than just that transparency in, in Chinese society. You are penalized for for failure. Uh, it's it's simply it's 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 a moral weakness. So, so so that was the genius of Silicon Valley. The genius of Silicon Valley was they took failure and they demoralized it. They say if someone takes a couple hundred million or a million hundred million dollars and loses it, it's not a moral failure. That's not a bad person. That was just, they didn't experiment and it didn't work. That's like science. That's a huge, that's a huge step away from, I don't know, 50 years ago or something when someone who had a business and they lost $500 million, they, that's a, that was a moral failure. That was considered irresponsible, weakness, selfishness, whatever it is. And so Silicon Valley demoralized failure, which is one of the reasons why I think the whole movement of um, blaming Facebook and other social media companies as being evil and moral failures is a complete step backwards. Because they, they're, they're just, they're trying to keep up. They're trying, they don't know what to do. They're not doing anything in purpose. They're trying their hardest in doing experiments. And they're now being prohibited from making failures, from doing things to test things, to try things out. And what, if you prevent someone for, from failing, that's the even, then you're going to have even more worse disasters. On that note of preventing people from failing, it, where do you stand in terms of regulation, specifically around things like AI and synthetic biology, where a lot yeah, of people yeah. want to tread carefully? Well, I think tread carefully is, is the word. So there is in the, I don't know, in the um, act, activist movement, there's a, a, a thing called the precautionary principle. And they apply it to mostly technological advances. And, and, and the premise is very simple, which is that we should not allow anything until we can prove, or it has been proven, to not cause harm. And at first glance, that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to request. Is like, okay, we're not going to adopt this until we can prove that it's not going to harm everybody. The problem is, there are many problems with it starting with the fact that all the existing technologies we have today are causing harm, but they're not being subject to that same criteria. So, so, so there, there's always harm, everything. In, in fact, doing nothing will cause harm. And all those have to be factored in and compared to the new harm that the new thing will bring. And secondly, um, uh, of course, it's hard to prove the, the absence of something, but um, th th there is a way in which um, we tend to once approve something, not to go back and look at it again. You know, FDA approves of drug and that's the end of it, but it could be misused. It could be used in a thousand different ways once it's approved. It could change over time. And so what we really want to have is something that I call the um, proactionary principle, where we are constantly checking and we're actually, again, using evidence-based for actual harms caused rather than imagined harms, which is a lot of what most precautionary principles is you can imagine something happening and therefore you get to prove that that imaginary thing won't happen. It's like, what? That doesn't work. So um, so we take an evidence-based thing is actually, so we, we, we try things, we use things. So we, we, we steer by use. We steer something by using it and, and trying to relocate it into a place where it is more useful and less harmful. And we base all on evidence of use rather than the, the fear of what could happen. And so um, the precautionary principle um, is I think the principle we wanna to bring to the new technologies with genetic engineering or whatever is we can, and Hollywood is really good at this. We can imagine a thousand things that could go wrong, but let's just talk about, let's, but we're, we're, we're not gonna do that because no invention has ever been used for what the inventor imagined at first for using. And so we're gonna use things and keep using them and keep tracking them constantly, going back, taking the data, changing our course based on what actually happens. And AI, I think is unique among almost any other technology we've had up to this point for the amount of energy and effort that we have spent imagining what it would do before it actually arrived. 
It's amazing how much attention we've given to something before it's possible. And I think as a net, I think that's a good, I think that's good that we're doing that, but we just have to unravel or step back and understand that while we want to do that, we don't want to make too much policy based on what we fear could happen and that we should use it to guide us in terms of running the experiments and trying stuff, but not necessarily in trying to make policies. So, I think we have to regulate. I think it's necessary. I think that's part of civilization. But I think that regulation has to be, can't be premature. And it has to be based on evidence of actual use. If we do that, I think we'll be much, much better. Now, you know, already in using things like AI, we can detect that there are some bias problems. Okay. And this is where the precautionary principle comes in. How do they compare to the other bias problems that we have? They're all the other systems. If we don't use that system, there's another system we're using. What what are its bias problems? Yeah. So so um, it's always in the context of either nothing or what's old. That has to be the new. It can't be compared just by itself. Yeah, as you're saying that, it's making me think that we're mad at AI for the bias problem, but in reality, what it did was expose a bias problem that existed for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. So kinda, right, right, right. Kind of helped move us forward in that regard. Um, well, and, and and that's something, by the way, that, that I would say about the kind of ethics, the AI ethics stuff. Um, we, it turns, I mean, it turns out that actually teaching AI ethics is actually pretty easy because it's this code, it's just the laws, it's the principles. The problem with the teaching the AI ethics, it would turn out to be, is that our ethics, human ethics, are so lousy, so shallow, they're so inconsistent, that when we went to examine them, we realized that there were, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't communicate them because they were just so, they weren't robust enough. Right. And in the process of having to teach the AI's ethics, what we're learning is to strengthen our own ethics as a civilization, to make it clear and more consistent. And so in that way, as always, um, our technology will make us better humans. So having to teach ethics to AI will make us better ethically. Yeah. I often think about it in terms of Jungian psychology, as in technology is almost the embodiment of our shadow, like the things about ourselves that we don't accept get manifested in technology. And then we get mad at technology for showing us a part of ourselves. I would agree with that other than the focus on the Jungian shadow, and I would say, well, it's also the Jungian halo. It's, it's, it's our best, mm -hmm. the technology is also a mirror of our best aspirations of humans, our superhumanness. Absolutely. So, so, so I think it's fair to say, yes, there's a projection of ourselves, but it's not just the negative shadow. It's also encapsulates the best of our humanity and our superhumanness. Speaking of the best, you know, you were talking there about how Hollywood has done a great job show, showing us dystopic right. futures. What is, can, can you paint me your, not utopic, but maybe your protopic version of the future, maybe a near term protopia where you, what you're kind of working towards? Yeah, it's a fair question. And actually, I am trying to write it down. Um, I would say that, um, that um, well, there's a couple of ways to frame it. There's a lot to say about it, but one interesting way to frame it was there was a, there was a uh, economist, uh, Robert Gordon, who was very skeptical of, of computers and the high tech stuff saying, look, you know, like Kenneth Arrow said, I mean, we see it everywhere, but we just don't see an economic uh, results. And he was saying that he believed it was, he was kind of the origins of this guy, the great stagnation, this idea that you're stagnating. And by his calculation, by his thesis, we were stagnating because they, because the, until now, the great leap forward and progress that we've seen has come about because there were like five one-time events, five one-time forces that came together that were only going to happen once in history. 
and that we kind of benefited from that. And, and an example of that was women moving into the workforce. Okay, well, that sort of only happens once. Now all the women are there, so okay. You don't have that boost anymore. And he had five of these one-time events. And so I've been thinking about, well, that may be true, but I think there are coming one-time events. I think there's five more ahead of us that are going to come. And um, trying to imagine what they could be. And um, one of them is, is this idea that um, we are going to come to the point where every single adult on the planet is linked up together. We have this kind of universal connection, this global one machine where we form kind of a, a, a entity that's capable of collaborating at the planetary scale. That will ha there will be a first time when that happens once. And I think we're gonna be alive for, for that moment where you have this awakening of this civilization, global civilization. So I think that's one thing. I think AI is the second thing. I think it happens one time when you bring in, you know, it's just like electrification, industrialization that happened once uh, I think this is where we kind of automate the intellect, make synthetic intelligence. That, 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 that's um, a one-time event, but they'll, it'll take a century for it to happen, but it's, it's sort of like it's a big thing. And I think there's so many things and problems that will come from that um, that it's bigger than industrialization in terms of event. And, and we are at the beginning of that, so we're going to see um, those things coming along in starting now. I mean, we're seeing it. So that's, that's there. And um, there's huge disruptions, but they're not, this is not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take 10 years, 15 years to make auto -driven, driving cars. They're not happening tomorrow. This can take a long time. We have to change the road structure. It's not just like you can put ro robots in cars. We're gonna change everything just like we changed the entire landscape to make cars work the first time. So, so this, this, this is a big engineering civilization project making all the driven cars. It's not a matter of just downloading the latest from Tesla. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen that way. So anyway, but I'm just saying it's a disruption, but it's not an overnight disruption. It's a decades long, if not centuries. So there's AI, there's, there, 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 there's universal connectivity. And um, I think um, the... Uh, the green energy thing is real. The solution, as we've figured out recently, is to electrify everything, stop burning anything, solar, hydro, wind, and nuclear to, uh, to make electrical everything, electrical cars, electrical heat pumps, electrical stoves, electrical planes, everything is electricity. It's much more efficient, cleaner, um, I'm more high tech. And so I think that gives us a promise of getting halfway to where we want to get in, um, in climate. Um, and so uh, that's a big business. That's, that's, that's good for the planet. That's good for people. It'll make our cities nicer. So, um, and, you know, it's part of the whole AI thing too. When you have electric, everything's electrified, it's much easier to, um, Cognify, and um, I could go on. So I think there's, I think there's a, a a number. I think there's five or six different trends, forces that are converging to make a, a planet where it's high tech, and that I would like to live. Um, I'm not afraid of the AI overlord. It, it's just, it's a Hollywood a romantic um, notion. I mean, again, I could talk for hours on why I think that's uh, unlikely. The singularity is unlikely. It's greater than zero, but unlikely. And um, so I, I think we're gonna muddle through with the AI and kind of make it work. I think we'll have green energy I think we'll have more globalism. And I think like the food um, situation is um, 
I'm a big proponent of the lab grown meat and other synthetic foods, both environmentally, somewhat morally, but even technologically and culinary in terms of we will invent new tastes and new ways of making food in a way they haven't been, you know, using animal cells and, and, and things. It's, it's very, very, very powerful. Um, and uh, I think um, food, shelter, I don't think it's gonna change very much. When I make a picture, it's like, hmm, that already happened. Yeah. That's, that's, that rearrangement is already done. I think cities are gonna look kind of like they do now, maybe the more pedestrian stuff, but we're not gonna change that much. Um, schooling, huge. I think YouTube is way under, uh, under uh, appreciated. I think the next thing after smartphones is a smart class, augmented reality. I think it's really huge in terms of education, learning kinetically, training, work. Work will change because of that. So in general, the vision is that the material world doesn't change very much. Most of the change is happening in the intangible world of what we make of it, what we think we are about, why we're here, what we're doing. And so, um, so I think that's where, I think you know, your self-identity, where your legions are, how you spend your day. I mean, what you spend your day about. I think all those things, will will change but you know my room here will probably look exactly like this in 100 years it's unlikely to change very much maybe there'll be screens on the wall instead of paint okay but by and large it's there's there's not a big difference there your brain will just be connected to every other humans and you'll be able to drop into yeah, virtual yeah, simulations yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I know we're pushing time here, Kevin, so I won't ask you any more of these long questions, but I want to give you a chance to let people know where to find your work and uh, anything you'd like to promote before we jump off of here. Yeah. Um, you can find anything I make at my uh, website, which, is, which has my initials, kk.org, kk.org. And um, I post on uh, Twitter at Kevin 2 Kelly. I think I'm Kevin 2 Kelly on Facebook and other social media. I, I, I don't do much engagement. It's more of a publishing mode for, for me. It's not on my phone. Um, I, actually, I don't even post. Often it's scheduled posts, meaning that it's, you know, it's all pre-posted. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, uh, kk.org is probably the best way to find me or contact me if you want. Oh, the one, actually, there is one little thing I want to promote. I have a newsletter called Recommendo, which it goes out every Sunday morning and it has for know, three or four years. And it has six really brief recommendations of cool stuff. Me, Mark Freinfelder from, from Boing Boing, Claudia here. The three of us do six brief together in total, two each, six brief recommendations. It's a free newsletter. Um, no ads, just half a page. You'll love it. So sign up for that. And can, can that be found through your website? Yes. That's called recommendo recommendo or recommendo.com. Um, so recommendo is the name of the newsletter and, um, uh, it's a labor of love, uh, as, um, Austin Keaton says, um, it's free, but not cheap. So, um, uh, we hope you enjoy it. Wonderful. Kevin, again, there's so many things I wish I could ask you, but I do appreciate taking the time that we had. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. I appreciate your questions and your interest in my work. So thank you for having me.